Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, thanks for joining today at the uh, third session of our interactive workshop series on sex differences in circadian rhythms and sleep. Um, before we start with anything, I just want to remind you that we are recording um, this webinar and we'll put it on YouTube afterwards, as we've done for the other ones, and also just remind you of the code of conduct that we have. Um, Welcome again on behalf of the entire organizing committee, which includes uh, Nayantara Santi, Ines Tora, and Lillian Hunt, and this workshop series was made possible uh, with funding from the Wellcome Trust and support from the Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion in Science and Health Group, EDIS. Um, just a reminder, we do have a code of conduct that we enforce, um, and uh, so if you have any concerns, please, please let us know. Um, a couple of house rules, uh, please keep the uh, microphones on mute during the sessions. Wait until the end of each presentation to ask your question. We'll use the chat again this time uh, for uh, for the Q and A. Type your question in the chat, and then we'll have a moderator that will pass it on and ask on your behalf uh, the question. Um, make sure you only ask one question, so no multi cascade or you know multi part questions. Just one question, uh, and again, we'll pre record everything and make sure to stay uh, here uh, till the workshop part which is the most exciting element. Uh, just sort of an overview of what this workshop series has been trying to address. We've been hearing really great talks in the last two sessions on uh, sex differences in circadian rhythms and sleep, understanding the impact of these. And just as a reminder, we have these YouTube videos or these recordings now available on YouTube, which you can watch on your own time. Uh, today, we're gonna to be talking about understanding change in this field, and we have two really exciting sp uh, speakers lined up. Um, just a little bit of an overview. We'll start with uh, two talks in the beginning. Uh, we'll take a quick break, uh, if time allows. Depends a little bit on how good the speakers are with keeping time. Um, and we'll take a quick break, and then we'll have the workshop part, which is the interactive component, where you'll be able to answer or ask questions or basically participate in, in, the, in, in, in the discussions. Um, without further ado, I want to uh, invite today's moderator to take over, and that is Ines. Yeah, thank you, uh, Manuel. So I'm going to start introducing uh, the first speaker of the um, session, and uh, this is uh, Dr. Natasha Karp. She's a principal biostatistician and uh, team leader with uh, AstraZeneca. And uh, she, one of her focuses has been uh, understanding sex biases in uh, preclinical research. And I think today she will cover uh, some of the standard practices to include uh, sex as a variable and her thoughts of uh, what the uh, existing uh, imbalance have, uh, exists and, and reflect on, on how change uh, can be achieved. So um, I've listened to her before and I'm really looking forward to hear what uh, he has to say today. So without further ado, please uh, over to you, Natasha. Thank you very much, Inesh. I'm just going to share my screen. Has that come through okay? Excellent, thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me to talk on this topic. Um, so I'm going to explore, you know, why it exists and um, some reflections on how to drive change in this area. So quickly, a very light skim of why does sex matter? Why does not sex bias exist in our preclinical research pipeline? The challenges of change, and then I'm going to reflect on a sociological exploration of the topic. So does sex matter? Well, actually, it seems very obvious that it does. If we think about it from our own perspective, we can see that the prevalence of the disease, the symptoms we experience, the progression of a disease, and the side effect that we will um, experience when we take drugs very much depends on our sex. So therefore, when we are thinking about patients, where we're trying to translate to sex matters. And we can also see this within preclinical research where people have studied both sex and assessed these questions. So this is a very large data set from the IMPC, which is the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, where they were looking at the effect of knocking out every single protein coding gene and characterizing the animals to relate the genotype to phenotype. And because they were breeding their own mice, they studied both males and females. 
And so they, the data set here was explored to assess the prevalence of sexual dimorphism. And to give you a sense of the scale of the data, there was 14,000 wild type mice in this data set, 40,000 mutant mice, looking across over 2,000 different knockout genes and studying up to 244 traits. And the idea here is to assess sexual dimorphism, not for any particular treatment, but more generally, when you run experiments, how often does sex play a role? So the first way the data was analysed was first focused on control data. So the variables can be split into two types. So categorical would be rare events, so as rib-shaped, normal or abnormal, and continuous variable would be things like sodium level or lean mass composition in the body. And what we found was that in categorical data, even though this is rare events, the abnormality rate is different for 10% of the variables, sometimes being higher in the males and sometimes higher in the females. Again, with the continuous variables, this time it was 60% of the variables had a difference between the males and the females, where sometimes the average was higher in the males and sometimes higher in the females. And so this matters because if we don't account for sex in our analysis of the data, then and we're going to miss some of the effects. Or if we don't account for sex and we allow it to confound our experiments, this would um, impact our studies. But maybe more interesting is how often did sex modify the treatment effect? So here it's when you're knocking out the gene. So here again, we can split the analysis into categorical and continuous. And the analysis pipeline first said, is there a significant treatment effect? And then whether it depended on sex. And in these pipelines, they only had seven male and seven females for each knockout animal. So their actual power to detect sexual dimorphism wasn't very high. But even so, in 13% of categorical data sets that had a significant treatment effect, it depended on the sex of the animals. And 16% of the continuous variables, the effect depended on the um, sex of the animals. So actually, when we, if we look, we are going to see a difference between the sexes at quite a high rate in our data sets. So even in spite of this evidence, the sex bias exists, and it exists throughout the preclinical research pipeline. We see it in the initial experimental design. So if you look at uh, Beery and Zika's study, looking across 10 fields of biology, 80% of the rodents used are males. And in fact, Mazur and Jones pointed out in 2015 that the sex bias has not changed in over a 20-year period which is actually highlighting that we've been discussing this issue for over 25 years in the literature. But it isn't only at the design stage that we have the problem. When we look at the analysis, even if you collect both sexes, only 33% of manuscripts actually analyse the data by sex, including it as a potential source of variance. And again, at the reporting, many papers don't give you details of what the sex of the data um, is collected on. And when, some, when I first started talking about sex as a biological variable, people said, well, surely if it's a female prevalent disease, people would study females. And I thought, OK, I'll go and have a look. What can I find? And I found one manuscript talking on the topic. And they said, female prevalent diseases, before manuscripts not report sex, and that did, only 12% studied females. So no, there's no guarantee that if your disease is targeting, um, is more prevalent in females, that it will be focused on female animals. We have established pipelines running in our institutes, which we focus on. So then very much is, why does a sex bias exist? This is not outright, this isn't, um, I can't think of the word now. It's not discrimination that we're only interested in males, but it's a structural issue that is arising from some misconceptions, skill gaps, practical concerns, and a 3R interpretation. And I'm going to focus on the 3R interpretation first, because in in vivo research, this is one of the fundamental things that influences our behaviour and how we design experiments. We design experiments to isolate cause and effect by simplifying. Biology is really complex, so we simplify into a very simple testing space. And currently, we typically test one genetic background, one animal, one housing condition, one age, and one day. And through that, the idea then is that you're going to minimise variation to maximise sensitivity and detect the effect. And this is very much being driven by the reduction element to the three R's, which has a historic definition of methods which minimise the number of animals used per experiment. And typically, when you go into the ethical discussions, there'll be debate over whether I've used five or six animals per group, and it'll be I've used five males per group. 
very focused on the absolute numbers within this single experiment. The fact that you bred females along with those males but then discarded them doesn't get counted in your numbers. But actually now the NC3Rs has suggested a new definition of reduction which doesn't talk about number of animals used because actually it's focused on um, experiments that are robust and reproducible and truly add to the knowledge base and that we need to move away of thinking in terms of absolute, absolute numbers. So why is it if we were going to focus on one sex did we select males and not female animals? Well it was because of a misconception that um, the female rats would be hormonal and because of variation in the hormone cycle they would be more variable and that you either had to deal with greater variation if you didn't match the cycle or you had to match the cycle and have multiple groups for your animals, female animals. But in 2014, a meta-analysis looking across 293 published articles compared the variants in males against the variants in females that were not matched in their cycle, hormone cycle, and found that in a global analysis, there was no difference in the variants between the males and the females. If you look at individual variables, there were three variables that had a difference and it was because the variants were higher in the males, not the females. So actually this is a very well established misconception that isn't based on any particular truth um, that is setting a behaviour pattern that we select male animals. And I will also argue that there is a skill gap. When we study one sex, we're in a very simple space. We have a control group versus a treatment group. We can analyze the data using a student t-test. We can use Excel to process the data. It's a very simple summary explanation. Often people just use bar plots. If you study both sexes, you're moving to a factorial design and you'll be using something like a two-way ANOVA to analyze the data. You'll be asking, what is the treatment effect after accounting for sex differences? But you get the benefit that you can ask whether the treatment effect depends on sex. But this is more complex to visualize and is more complex to run. You won't be able to do this in Excel. And we know that people are quite anxious when it comes to statistics. Four out of 10 Americans will publicly say that they hate mathematics. Mathematical anxiety is a recognized condition. And each time you add an equation to a manuscript, you will get 28% fewer citations. Nobody thinks there's anything wrong with saying, I hate statistics. And in fact, you're considered a geek if you like statistics. So really, there's also, you know, it isn't just that people don't like it. They haven't received the training. It isn't a normal thing to have extensive experimental design or statistical analysis training. Yet we're expecting people to be able to do these things as part of their everyday job. And because of this lack of experience in experimental design and data analysis, this leads to a new misconception that if you want to study both sexes, you have to double the number of animals that you're going to use. But actually, the advice is to keep doing what you're already doing, but change half the animals to female. And, you know, that seems initially counterintuitive and that's because you've been used to thinking about statistical power in a comparison of a randomized complete design where you have a control group and a treated group and the n is the comparison is just between those two groups when you move to a factorial design you're estimating the treatment effect across the two sexes and provided there is no significant interaction effect the power will be the same as a t-test if there is a significant interaction, then you found out something very biological interesting, and that was worse the loss of power in that situation. So what the advice that is coming through isn't to design your experiment to be able to detect an interaction effect, but rather you design your experiment that you always study both sexes and in the situation where a large interaction affection occurs, provided you plot your data and run the analysis it to consider it, you will detect it when it matters. Now, this is me, you know, arguing that a lot of the issues are misconceptions, but I would like to highlight there are practical issues. Studying both sexes does increase the complexity. We cage our animals by sex to avoid, of course, unwanted pregnancy and so that they have company. But then you have questions about how do you process the animals? Do you process them in males first and then females? Because you're going to introduce order effects. Are you going to randomize the cages? If you do that, would the presence of the female animals trigger welfare issues of fighting with the males or could it alter their behavior? And so 
there are complexities that we need to explore. Should you clean equipment between sexes or should you allow an odour cloud to build up so that it becomes the new norm that you're measuring against? And these can only be answered on a case by case scenario and study exploring the issues for each experiment. But people do have experience of studying two sexes. How do you practically do it is something that we need to share as a community. For the in vitro community who again have the same sort of statistics as in the in vivo that they predominantly use male cells. It is because the belief there is a belief that the sex of the cell is irrelevant once you remove it from a hormonal environment and often the sex of the cells are not known and this you know there's numerous papers that show that this isn't a good idea and i particularly like this one this was in 2007 and it was a stem cell treatment for muscular dystrophy and they had real heterogeneity in their response and instead of abandoning the experiment they actually started to try and unpick why were the results so variable and they found that the results were var the variability was arising from the sex of the donor and the sex of the recipient. And now they've got a much greater nuanced understanding of the biology that can really, you know, if they hadn't done this, this would have been a missed opportunity to really de deliver a, a treatment to our patients. So we've been talking about this for over 25 years, but change hasn't happened. And reality is, is we need to reflect on is that we're asking people to change practice and this issue we've reflected on and written up as a manuscript in the British Journal of Pharmacology last two years ago now and I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of what we talk about in that. We're going to reflect on a number of management techniques to try and understand what the blocker is to change and therefore what we can do to help that change journey. And the first thing is to understand is that we're very much our behaviour is driven by our culture, which is the way we do things around here. And that is actually driven by our unconscious beliefs, the underlying assumptions that we use to drive our decisions. And what's very useful to think about your culture is the onion model. And the onion model, the formal guidelines are the outer expression of our beliefs. And then the processes and workflow is how we implement it. But actually what drives our, our beliefs are our unspoken assumptions. And if you want to change things, you can't just change the guidelines because if there are odds with your underlying assumption, nothing is going to change. And at the moment, when I initially talk to people, I would argue that people are these underlying assumptions that we need to address. It isn't possible to include both sexes. I can't justify it from a three R perspective or there is no benefit to including women. We can just generalize. There's no evidence I need to do that. It won't translate will be the feedback. We have to challenge these underlying assumptions to actually allow the formal guideline changes to have an impact. On an individual basis, you can use the Kuba Ross change curve to understand people's emotional reaction to change. And this was originally developed by in the context of grief, but then adopted for the business world. And it talks about how initially we react to change with shock or denial or anger and very much this resistance to these ideas. And that as you travel through that journey, you can start to then experiment with the ideas and make a decision about whether you're going to engage with it and then potentially integrate it. Now, for me, I find this very helpful to basically understand that I'm going to be hit initially with shock or denial and anger. But that doesn't mean that I should stop the conversation. I have to ride that initial emotional reaction to get through to the actual starting that discussion to see whether we can actually experiment with the idea. So the question is, is what strategies can we use to help people move through this emotional reaction to allow us to move towards actually experimenting with testing both sexes in our research? So what are the tactics people talk about? So Gary York raised that the different strategies can lead to three reactions. There can be resistance, which is where people dig in their heels and actively undermine the engagement to change that you're trying to do. There can be reluctance compliance, which is where people do it when they're looking at you or nod when you're talking about it, but actually don't truly engage with the idea. And there's commitment where people become advocacies for the change that you're interested in. But what about the strategies? So here are some of the tactics he talks about and he loosely groups them into positive and negative and positive lead to commitment and negative lead to resistance. So we're currently in a positive strategy of rational persuasion where I'm trying to um, explain the thinking behind why and hopefully lead you to commit to these ideas. The NIH with their funding are using exchange. Unless you um, engage and start studying both sexes, you're not going to receive the money to conduct your research.
a powerful strategy is consultation. And that is because in consultation, you start to listen. And instead of just telling people what to do, which is a pressure strategy that leads to resistance, you actually unpick what are the true blockers. And so it takes time. And you can do um, an inspirational appeal. And for me, the uh, muscular dystrophy, an example, is one of those inspirational appeals. Look at the richer understanding we can um, achieve if we engage with these ideas. So they inspire us to engage because our science could be so much better. But two of the other strategies he talks about, which I think can be presented in a positive light, but also could be presented in negative, are legitimizing. If I say that the Jackson lab study two sexes every, all the time in their behavioral, people can either be inspired that the Jackson lab are doing it or become resistant that, um, you know, it's just not achievable and we don't want to engage because it comes across as pressure. And that is similar with the coalition building. A coalition should be a group of people coming together to provide inspiration and resources to consultation. But it could be come across as a pressure strategy telling you that you have to do this to deliver the science rather than leading you and assisting you in the journey. So one of the things that I found very useful in the management theory was a force field analysis, because this is a sort of very holistic view of why the status quo is as it is. And what you do is you quantify the forces driving the change and the forces resisting the change on a scale of one to four. And if the forces resisting the change are larger than the forces driving the change, then we maintain the status quo. So what we have to do is we have to weaken the forces resisting and strengthen the driving forces. And then we can defrost the status quo and refreeze in the new situation. And if we look at the forces resisting the change, you can see that they dominate. They are, that's not how we do it. And it isn't how we've been doing it for 25 years. It's this three R interpretation. There is some money concerns, but if it's not the number of animals, it still be the cage and maybe time. There is analysis complexity. There's practical concerns of how you're going to do this in the lab and there's a belief in the value. And the forces driving change are not so immediate. They're a little bit more nebulous. They're women's health, the replicability crisis. The things that become, become much more concrete are the journals and the funders, the ethical boards and the institute culture or the professional bodies culture and the leadership there can be the things that could really strengthen and start to tip the balance. And I have one last management theory I wanted to share with you. And this is an institute level plan. And this was put together by John Cotter, a professor from Harvard, and he suggested an eight step change process. And what I like about his theory is that he highlights that the initial stages are all about leadership, willing the hearts and mind and changing that inner core of the onion model. And the later stages are about management because often when you think about change you jump to what practically do you need to change rather than the leadership elements that we actually need to engage with first and the other thing he highlights is that if you don't go through the full eight stages you don't anchor the change in the culture and instead what happens is people revert back to form and you don't maintain the momentum and so you can have initial steps towards your journey but then it just all slowly disintegrates and you know, we go back. So the initial stages are creating the urgency, the burning platform, the need to change, which the NIH is helping us very well with their funding model. We can then form a powerful coalition, which is people across all levels of organization, right down to the senior people and influential people in Animal House, to actually start creating that vision for change. You truly understand <clears throat> the um, issues that are being discussed. You have to create your vision as a soundbite, not a four page document that isn't going to be inaccessible and not really be read because your vision has to be communicated with high repetition and is all about winning the hearts and Maya and inspiring people. It's this leadership element and you're going to need to communicate the vision with high repetition. If you think about the amount of information we receive in a classic week, you know, an announcement and a talk is going to have very little impact in our worlds. And only then can you start to remove the obstacles and create short term wins. So short term wins would be, can we get an example where someone's done this in your field and explore how to present the data and demonstrate the value added. And then that can be used to refine the vision, refine the efforts to remove the obstacles so that you build on the change and it then becomes the new norm. 
So the last aspect I wanted to talk about was a sociological exploration of the issue. And this was based on, this is um, Annika Gomper's remaster's dissertation that I had the opportunity to read from Cambridge University. And she interviewed um, nine US scientists about the NIH um, initiative. And what her research is qualitative research looking for patterns of meaning or themes. And she identified that there were conflicting themes and she highlighted three in particular. First of all, she highlighted that biologists completely believe in the importance of generalizability, that you have to understand and embrace variation to understand biological differences. So sex matters. However, and here comes the however, to make progress in science, we reduce the complexity. We simply testing space into um, a and there are practical decisions of the testing space that we're going to operate within. Have I lost everyone? Are I still there? Excellent. Okay. So there's practical issues between and so this is mediating the tension between how generalizable our experimental space is and avoiding complexity and she's not talking about the practical complexity of processing the animals and collecting the data she is talking about the complexity of making scientific decisions when we are converting our original research question we are converting it into a doable problem in this testing space does treatment have an effect yes no and in a way, we want a simple answer. We're not testing for different ages, different diets, different strains, because we want to say this treatment has an effect. Yes, no, in this environment. And now I can progress on to the next question. If we try and unpick all the different nuances of the biology of that effect, we get lost within the woods of that effect. And so we simplify and we have made the choice to simplify that we basically test one sex. And so we have to work out how are we going to do it a doable problem where we're now studying in the context of two sexes, not just one. So in conclusion, I would argue that sex bias is culturally embedded in our research pipeline and it impacts the whole pipeline, the reporting, the design and the analysis. And we know from our focus now on things such as precision medicine, um, that giving a more nuanced treatment effect is really critical to having an impact on the healthcare and the impact of our research. We can see that research suggests that sex is a significant source of variation for both in vivo and in vitro research. But this isn't an individual scientist issue, but a scientific practice issue. Um, we operate within a network, not in isolation. And so the question is, is how do we support scientists to be more mindful of sex in their research as a community, rather than just telling individuals that they need to change? And um, here are my acknowledgements of, of my journey through in these thinking of these ideas and developing this research in these areas. So thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. That was excellent. Uh, and I hope uh, you're going to have uh, many questions about what you just said. So I'm just going to, um, Manuel, if you can open the, the chat for the questions. Uh, let's see if I can get access to it. Uh, it, sh it should be open. Okay. Um, so I'm just, I'm going to start with, uh, with one question. Um, about the what's what's your interpretation of some of the studies that have been um, have been published about differences also when the uh, in terms of sex not so much sex variability but in terms of whether the researcher is from a that is observing the study or analyzing the study is from a different sex from the animals that are being studied. Yeah, so this is a topic that actually is very close to my heart. And this is a very big topic. This is all the inference testing space and the testing space that our estimates affect are very unique to a particular environment. And that actually we need to embrace designs that are more encompassing of the normal variation. And um, there's there's a couple of papers that have just come out this month on this topic that I'm involved with that we can talk about it. But yeah, I think it's a very true effect. You know, animals uh, have phenotypic plasticity as an evolution and 
ability to survive and adapt to the environment and in a way we've forgotten about that when we design the experiments and we're thinking that animals have a pure pure treatment effect we just have to isolate down to but it isn't treatment effects are very context dependent and there are simple ways that we can make our experiments a bit more generalizable without increasing the number of animals significantly and sex is one of those that we need to start thinking about of the animals and there are ways to address the issues of the context in our practical collecting the data thank you so we have one question from barbara parry and she's asking does clinical research show the same resistance to change i'm guessing compared to preclinical research actually i would say yes it does. So I think they've gone further on their journey because one, they're told to, and the regulators have required them to include both sexes. But if you look at their research, they are including both sexes at the late stage clinical trials, but not at the early stage clinical trials. And they're tending not to analyze the data by sex. They're only analyzing the data by sex when they don't get a really nice result, nice result. Then they start going, well, maybe we can work out which population it responds to, rather than having that automatically in their pipeline. Um, and I've been working with someone to talk about how we can get more um, females included in the very early clinical trials and what changes are needed there. So no, I, I don't think, I think it's the same, but they're slightly further on because they're more regulated. Okay, uh, thank you. And, and one qu last question from uh, Lily. Uh, do you think bio researchers should look to upskill in the statistical analysis of sexes or there should be dedicated statisticians to support researchers for this? I think as statisticians are very mixed breed. And so I think sometimes the problems can be is that you can be sent to a statistician and not understand each other at all. And therefore that isn't any help. And there's a shortage of statisticians who you can understand. So I think in the reality, you have to upskill yourself to be able to do this because you truly understand the nuance of what you're trying to do. Um, I do think there is an importance that institutes and other areas should look to provide that training and provide the expertise. But very much in my philosophy as someone who supports sci scientists doing research isn't that I want to take away from what they're doing, their analysis from them. Instead, I want to upskill them because the amount of work that they're conducting is far greater than any couple of statisticians can support. So it is about upskilling scientists is the way forward. Okay, thank you. I know we have uh, more questions, but uh, for the, in the interest of time, uh, uh, please hold your questions and maybe you will, we will be able to cover these uh, in, the, in, in the last uh, part. And um, we're going to move to our second speech, uh, speaker now. So thanks so much, Natasha, for a fascinating topic. So we're, we're going to move from preclinical um, design of uh, research to maybe more at the end stage of the uh, equation, which is when we end up wanting to publish our research. So um, let me introduce you, um, I'm Rita Aliwalia. Uh, she's a professor of uh, vascular pharmacology at uh, Queen Mary University of London. And uh, her focus is on the cardiovascular system, but today she comes here more in her capacity as a champion of uh, gender equality. So she established the first mentoring scheme for women in the British Pharmacological Society, and she has been chair of the Women in Pharmacology, in Pharmacology Committee. And uh, today she's going to tell us about her experience uh, when she introduced a policy um, in, at the British Journal of Pharmacology. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to uh, <laughs> listening to you as well. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I'll just share my screen. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the organisers for inviting me to speak. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've been asked to share with you the experiences that we had at the British Journal of Pharmacology in uh, introducing a policy for considering sex as an experimental variable. Um, but just a little bit of background first, I just thought I'd tell you that I am the first female editor-in-chief of the history of the journal uh, next year marks its 75th 
anniversary. And as Ines said, um, I'm a cardiovascular pharmacologist. And actually, I personally have a, an interest in sex differences in, in vascular inflammation, and I have published on that. So I have some experience of the, of the research setting and particularly actually clinical research. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on the journal, actually, uh, as I said, the journal's uh, been around for a long time. It started in 1946, took its um, current title in 1968. The very first editor-in-chief was uh, Sir John Gadam. And um, there's a picture of him to the right there. You can see how things have changed over the years. Um, you'll know him. He's very famous. He discovered substance P, but also worked on the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and, of course, LSD. Um, an important consideration about uh, BJP is that uh, it is a journal that is owned by the British Pharmacological Society. Um, uh, we're a hybrid journal so that means there is subscription income but there's also open access um, uh, opportunities for publishing in the journal and fees are generated in that manner too but the key issue here is that um, the journal is owned by the society and uh, almost all of the income that is generated from the sales um, of the journal come back to the society and support the discipline support researchers um, throughout uh, internationally. The journal actually began its life, as I said, in 1946, and, and, and it was uh, set up essentially to provide a forum for dissemination of pharmacological research in the UK. Um, but actually the journal today is very much an international journal. On our editorial board, we have 21 countries uh, represented by the editors. And just as a note, 26% uh, of our, our board are, are women. Um, as a society-owned journal, um, the journal is very limited to um, transparency and scientific rigor. And uh, in to um, deliver this, this commitment and support to the community, uh, what we have done in the past few years, over the past five years or so, is that we've published a number of guidelines in key areas um, that we believe address the transparency and issues of rigour that have been very much in the um, lay, but also, of course, in the scientific press. But what we've tried to do is to provide um, pragmatic solutions and we heard a little bit from Natasha in, in her talk just now about the need, need to upskill researchers in some of the methodologies that are needed to be able to provide or conduct experimental work that is reproducible and uh, transparent and as well as ensuring a strong rigor in the research process. But some of these approaches are complex. And actually what we've specifically done uh, at BJP is to try and identify, as I said, pragmatic approaches, taking into consideration the many pressures and difficulties that surround doing uh, research that we experience, every, all researchers experience internationally. Um, in creating these guidelines, what we have done is we've created checklists that act as a, an aid memoir to help uh, researchers, authors, editors, senior editors, editors in chief in uh, remembering the key issues and the um, primary areas of, of best practice in terms of updating. And we update our guidance on a regular basis. And, and here we have a list of the areas in which we have generated guidance documents and included in this is sex as an experimental variable. So one of the major areas where um, we have, the journal has played a, 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 I would say a substantial role in raising the profile of um, Bechtis and the changes that have been taking place over the past few years is, is in design and analysis. And my predecessor, Ian McGrath, uh, actually was the, uh, the person who first instituted it with the support of his senior editorial board, uh, a design and analysis policy back in October 2015. 
Um, in March 2018, myself, along with the senior editorial board, looked at our design and analysis again and uh, generated an update um, that we published in this editorial in BJP uh, in March. Now, the key points in these um, editorials and the requirements for publication in the journal are that um, randomization should be considered as also blinding in experimental conduct. Uh, a key issue is sample size. And uh, if you read the editorial, you see that there are mandated minimum sample size that uh, is expected by the journal uh, for data sets that uh, are subject to statistical analysis. We um, also give guidance on how data should be handled. Again, Natasha was talking about uh, lack of experience in, in terms of understanding how to handle data. And at least to the pharmacological community, we have generated a number of um, uh, best practice approaches that we've shared uh, with the research community, the pharmacological community through our editorials. And we've also given guidance, again, about st uh, statistical analysis. In general, our guidance is simple, easy to uh, use, and we give examples where we apply our guidance within the editorial. So our, uh, our aim in uh, informing the research community is that we provide uh, approaches, guidance, examples of best practice uh, at the current time, but also best practice with uh, considering pragmatic and practical approaches to, to experimental design and analysis. But in doing this most recent update, I realized that one key issue that was missing from our design and analysis guidance document was the consideration of the sex as an experimental uh, variable. And part of the, the reason, uh, when I started to look around, um, I uh, realized that there were some organizations that were actually making some substantial moves in providing guidance with regards to sex as an experimental variable. And the guidance was referred to by Natasha, uh, which was launched by the NIH in June 2015. And essentially what the NIH did is they, they said that they were changing the way that uh, researchers could make applications for funding and that a key question that all applicants would have to answer is how has their experimental design incorporated sex as a variable? And if it hasn't, why hasn't it? Um, very recently, there's been an article just published uh, this year in 2020 in the Journal of Women's Health. And the, the um, key researchers that were involved in setting up this um, policy led by um, uh, Janine Clayton have done a, an analysis of how this policy has led to, the, uh, to change. And um, in they've looked at the, the past five years and they found that there has been improvements in clinical research, but in particular, um, they surveyed the panel members of NIH grants. And um, you can see that over the years that there was a general feeling that the grant submissions that were, were being made actually had, had um, the policy had effectively led to change in terms of consideration of sex as an experimental variable. So here was an example um, that we had in front of us about the NIH uh, examining the, uh, the current landscape, identifying many of the issues that Natasha mentioned, uh, sex bias and experimental work, both preclinical and clinical and designing a process um, and providing diagrams. Here you see a flowchart that support researchers in trying to change the way in which they're doing their research. So um, what uh, this slide shows is the timeline um, that the journal uh, went through to, to bring about our policy change. So in December 2017, um, when we were discussing the new update to the design and analysis um, editorial and guidelines, um, we realized that sex uh, was uh, not included in that particular uh, update, but that actually we needed to focus specifically in a separate set of guidelines and uh, editorial document. Uh, but what we decided to do immediately was to make a call for papers um, to uh, publish research 
in the journal that was focused on assessing sex differences in biological responses. And Natasha was one of the individuals that we um, approached to ask to contribute to this themed issue. The next step actually um, was for us to um, take a look at some of our data, take a look at um, organizations like the NIH who had made a substantial uh, change to their policy and discuss this amongst ourselves and, and uh, try and identify what the key issues were for pharmacologists publishing in BJP. Um, and uh, we had a meeting in December uh, 2018 and uh, that involved the senior editorial board of which there are 11 members, myself and uh, members of the Wiley editorial office in the, the British Pharmacological Society. And a number of key concerns were raised during that meeting regarding um, the problems and the issues with sex as an experimental model. And I've just highlighted some of the key concerns that were expressed at that meeting. Um, clinical uh, trials, there, there, there has been change in terms of the numbers of women that uh, uh, are included in clinical trials. And as Natasha mentioned, the later phase trials, there have been changes, although even in the recent COVID-19 epidemic, you can see that um, there, there are differences in the way that um, the influence of sex is reported and often not. But um, in general, uh, we, we know that trials are not designed to actually examine the influence of sex. And actually in this publication here published by Geller et al, when uh, researchers have looked at their data and looked at what sex, the influence of sex, often actually since the studies weren't designed to explore this, the outcomes and conclusions are misleading. Uh, so there has to be some care in retrospectively going back to data sets uh, to look at the influence of sex. And actually what we need to have is more prospectively designed studies exploring sex. But one of the key concerns of course is that this lack of focus on sex means that women perhaps are not well served uh, with respect to therapeutics and treatment. And this is demonstrated with respect to common disease. Um, this data here that I'm showing between 1997 and 2000, 10 medications were withdrawn by the FDA from the US market. And actually what was discovered from those 10 medications is that eight of them posed a greater risk uh, for women than they did for men. And this in large part has been um, uh, suggested to be attributed to the fact that women and uh, females are not included in the whole research process that starts early at the preclinical stage all the way up to the clinical. And then of course, as Natasha said, there is a major um, uh, sex bias in preclinical research, research. There are clear differences in, in biology, many um, uh, examples of differences in, in drug mechanism of action between the sexes. And of course, this issue of uh, the waste of, of animals, particularly when people are, are breeding colonies. Uh, what is the case in many environments is that uh, when um, uh, animals are being bred, that the females are culled uh, prior uh, to weaning. And these are big issues for the pharmacological uh, field and environment. We took a look at our own data actually, and we went back to the very first volume of BJP and compared it with uh, 2019. And there's some good news and some bad news. Um, what you can see in, in 1946, actually sex was not considered at all. Uh, over uh, three quarters of uh, the articles that were published in that issue, and there were 27 articles in both of these issues, there's absolutely no mention of sex at all. Um, there was uh, one article where both sexes were used uh, and then there were, uh, there were uh, two articles where males um, uh, were used only and then a number where sex wasn't specified. But if you look in 2019 actually you can see that there is some good news here that um, in BJP that uh, a, a large proportion um, over half of the articles that are published in the journal uh, clearly, uh, sorry, over three quarters of the articles clearly uh, state sex in their, in their work. However, 
there uh, are a significant and important number still not mentioning sex at all. And I can tell you that um, those articles not mentioning sex, the vast majority were in cell-based systems. And this is a, actually an issue that's very important in BJP and I'll come to it in just a, just a moment. But um, the, we, we looked at um, the drivers uh, for this um, um, uh, absence of sex, but also this change um, to predominantly, whilst set, stating the sex actually that they were predominantly male. Um, and actually there's lots of rationale related to uh, variability that again, Natasha mentioned in her talk. And perhaps at least for pharmacologists, there was a very influential pharmacologist, um, uh, Lewis, who published a, a very well-known textbook of pharmacology way back in 1960. And uh, when an influential individual like that tells us that what we need to do to make our experiments more robust is to use the same strain, the same age, the same weight and the same sex, I think this, this kind of um, advice is advice that is, is taken on board when you have such an influential individual um, uh, making suggestions about the way that experiments should be conducted. Um, but as uh, Natasha mentioned, this, this idea that, that females add to the variability of the data uh, and that this is largely due to the fact that the, the estrus cycle causes changes in biology has not necessarily been borne out by studies that have now demonstrated that the variability in biological response between um, uh, within males and within females is largely the same. So um, after discussing all of this, what we decided to do is to make a draft of uh, our editorial where we discussed all of these issues. Um, we also discussed um, some of the difficulties in um, the designs, uh, the mechanisms of creating the best designs for considering sex as an experimental variable and the statistical analysis. And one of the recommendations in our draft um, uh, relates to the specific types of statistical analysis that can be used to interrogate uh, sex. And again, Natasha mentioned those, the factorial design and application of two-way analysis of, of variance. Um, you can see that uh, once we had had our discussions that actually the process um, in developing our editorial and our guidelines was uh, fairly rapid. Over uh, the next two or three months, um, we generated the document, it was approved by the senior editors and the editorial was published. Um, and this is the editorial. And in this, we made some specific um, uh, recommendations and some mandate. And what we agreed at the end, and this is now mandated for BJP, is that we require sex to be considered as an experimental variable. Uh, we recommend that, the, that this is included in the design stage of experimental work, but we recognize that by the time articles come to BJP, uh, that um, the experiments have been done and actually it isn't possible to have sex as an experimental variable at that stage. And what, but what we require is that all authors, um, if they have got sex as an experimental variable, they state the details of that design. And if they haven't, they provide a full justification of why not. And that is published in the article. Um, we recommend that all experiments should include both sexes and that uh, goes across the in vitro and in vivo setting. When looking at the pa uh, papers published in our journal, we discovered that for um, in vivo experiments, it's clear that there is an obvious uh, issue that we can easily address by requesting the sex of the animals used in the study. But it is also true for cell culture data um, that it is very, very rare that when one reads a paper that the um, for primary cultures, for instance, that the sex of the animal or the human uh, from where those cells uh, were collected is stated. We now mandate that uh, this must be stated in the method section of uh, all manuscripts submitted to BJP. We recommended multifactorial designs 
Um, and we also ask authors to consider the caging um, uh, setup of the animals and the way in which the data is collected from the uh, in vivo experiments in terms of proximity and give some discussion in the article about what the, what the issues are. And as I said, because we've taken a pragmatic approach where we're not mandating that sex is an experimental variable, we understand that this cannot be done in uh, retrospectively, that we uh, authors discuss the implications of their findings for both sexes, discuss what the impact of their findings might be for the sex that wasn't necessarily uh, included in the experimental design. And this is uh, one of the mandates of the journal and uh, there's the link on this slide that will direct you to the editorial. And then finally, in November 2019, we published uh, the sex differences themed issue. Um, and essentially, this, by doing this, what we were trying to do is demonstrate that BJP is a place where um, uh, sex differences research can be published. Um, but we now provide guidance and support to uh, authors, but also researchers in the early stages of the research about the best ways, uh, pragmatic ways to approach their research. So our hoped for outcomes are that um, we increase consideration of sex and experimental design uh, for the, uh, across the pharmacological community. That the aim is to improve the reproducibility of pharmacological research through importantly for us pragmatic solutions. And that um, by publishing our uh, editorial and by uh, introducing uh, this, these guidelines with recommendations and mandate that we raise the importance of uh, studying both sexes in pharmacological uh, research. Um, and that's the end of my talk. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Amrita. Another very exciting uh, talk, very interesting journey from, I uh, think, I guess it, it must have been quite interesting from the first conversations to finally see that uh, editorial written uh, and published. So let's see uh, what questions we have uh, now. Uh, okay, so uh, Nina says, uh, thank you, great to see journals taking this seriously. Um, Barbara says, in a clinical study of pregnancy, I received the critique that I had not sufficiently addressed sex as a biological variable and how to respond. <laughs> My goodness, I really don't. I hope that wasn't at BJP. I can't imagine how you might uh, consider. I mean, possibly what they're talking about is they're talking about the influence of the um, sex of the fetus on the outcome or the biological variable that you're interested in in your particular study. My guess is that must be what they're referring to, but otherwise I'm afraid I'm at a loss to answer uh, that question. That seems a really strange thing to be asking. And uh, Lily is asking, how did you upskill your reviewers to assess uh, submissions against your new policy? That's really interesting. So um, uh, I suppose one of the steps I missed out there is that, um, so we have a small senior editorial board, the 11 senior editors, and they're very much engaged and very much part of developing our policy. But we also include all of our editors. So we have about 106, I think 105 editors uh, that cover the very broad remit that we, we have at uh, BJP. And they were actually involved in breakout sessions discussing the influence of sex on biological variables prior to developing our policy document. Um, and what we, we do with our reviewers uh, is that we provide direction to some of our editorials um, and uh, our guidelines and guidance when they have to, when they get engaged in the review process. Um, but we have done quite a lot of um, PR around some of these um, changes that we've adopted at the British Journal of Pharmacology. And as Natasha says, um, in general, when change is, is introduced, there's a great deal of resistance. 
and there have been many people that have been quite upset with some of the changes that have been instigated at BJP. Um, however, what I would say is that over time, uh, the um, unhappiness disappears. And uh, what we find is that both the authors who are submitting papers to the journal, but um, also the reviewers and the editors uh, all willingly take up some of the, um, the guidance that we're giving at BJP. So it's been an interesting experience. Um, at the beginning, reviewers and sometimes editors uh, suggest that there are enormous difficulties in in addressing some of these issues but actually there's been quite a positive response from authors when the questions are being raised they're happy to be transparent uh, when we give them clear direction about what's needed for their articles yeah okay we have one last question uh, are do you know other journals that are also actively addressing this issue this issue well Actually, in the article that I mentioned that came out in the Journal of Women's Health, I mean, I can provide that. There are only two journals that are cited as having made a change in terms of sex as an experimental variable. And one of them is us. And I'm just trying to find the article. I'll let you know there is one other journal that has, has followed suit. Um, so two journals at the moment. But I think, you know, it's an um, iterative process. The funders, uh, by, by funders mandating consideration of sex, it comes at the very earliest stage because at that point, the researchers are in a position to modify design. Yeah. So journals have a really important role in perhaps waking people up to concepts and ideas that maybe they hadn't previously considered. Um, but actually, the funders also play a really essential role in directing and gearing researchers into identifying approaches that they can apply to make sure that sex is considered in their experimental design. Yeah, and I think some of those uh, issues are going to be discussed later on also, with, and, and Lily is going to cover that in, in her workshop. So thank you so much for, for your talk and uh, looking forward pleasure. to more discussion. So I think now Lily is going to take over and we're going to have a little break. Yes, um, so I noticed we're at 35 already, so I'm just going to say just a quick sort of two minutes stretch for everyone because I know it's quite a lot to be sat in front of computers all in this time. So what I'm going to do is in that process, I will share the screen for the polling section of the workshop, which will be up now. So if everyone could come back at 4.37 um, and log on to menti.com, uh, either on your phone or on your computer and using the code 220119, and then I'll crack on with the workshop after that. So, okay. So if everyone who's here is able to jump onto menti.com using the code 220119, and then there's a little button, there's a little thumbs up like, you could give that a press so I know that you're here as well. And then we can uh, know roughly how many people are gonna be answering each one before I, each question before I go on to the next. Um, what I will be doing throughout this is though, I will be pulling in um, Amrita, Natasha and Inez for some of the conversation at some various times, be directing some of the questions. I've got the Zoom chat window up as well. So you can feel free to pop thoughts and questions in there and we'll try and address them as we go along. Um, and there's also a Q&A function on Menti as well, which I think allows you to put an idea on, which other people could then also like, but we'll, we don't have to use that. But if you want to explore that, please feel free to use it. And I should be able to access all of that as we go through. Um, for those of you who've been here the previous two workshops, you'll know that there's basically a lot of questions that get posed to you all as participants. And we use those hopefully to inform us with the write-up of this. But actually this workshop's gonna be a little bit more There'll be a little bit more conversation around each of the question points um, because there's less questions and it's mostly around sort of ranking ideas um, that would allow change to happen. So um, we've covered a lot of these ideas already earlier today and also some of them are taken from the questions that we asked last week. So it took some of the main themes that came out of that um, to develop these. So hopefully we'll get lots of things covered, but if there's something we've missed, that's when I would love for you to use the Q&A and add your thoughts into there as well. Um, that way we can cover everything as we go through this. Um, so we've got a couple of people still coming in, just the last section here. Um, 
Natasha, I really appreciate you answering some of those questions in the chat bar as well. Thank you for that. I know there are lots of good good questions that also uh, were coming through as we were going through this. Um, so the first thing that we're going to get everyone to do, which we've done the past two as well, is just a simple um, what uh, what best describes the work you do in your current role. We think this is really important for us to know who's here as a researcher, policymaker, funder, publisher. We've got healthcare, clin clinical. We've also got clinician, scientist in there. Um, and if you don't think that you're represented here, please feel free to pop that in the Q&A section so we also know what other um, types of roles we're covering here with this. Previously, we've had an incredibly large number of researchers, which is, I think, great because it means we can focus a little bit. But also, we know that we've also been massively missing people from funding um, in these uh, talks. So when we come up with some of these ideas of what actions can happen off the back of these workshops, we know that we're going to need to engage with funders in some way, shape or form. Um, rather than having them have, having heard everything that we've heard from our great speakers as well. Um, so I'll leave that up for a little bit longer. I think we had a couple of other people. Um, I think the previous slide said 35 or something like that. So we can just pop that through there. Um, so. OK, so we're back up to 35. So I'll kind of go through these as and when we sort of get to roughly that sort of number of people. Um, but don't feel like, you know, you you can't still answer questions as we go through as well. Um, I think we've got a very similar sort of spread from, compared to last week for this um, uh, and a few less people in this section of the workshop. But we will be publishing all of the results from these polls as well as we go through, um, including the word clouds and the various other things from the previous workshops. because They are in really interesting uh, pieces of work. So the first thing I just wanted to say is, um, as I mentioned, um, before answering each of the question, we will have a quick discussion between Amrita, Natasha, uh, Inez and myself. Um, you can add your thoughts in the Q&A as well. And then um, after that, I suggest answering the questions because there'll be a ranking system. It'll be good to hear what people's thoughts are on the ideas that are put on there too. So the first question here, I think this is uh, really important, which is around where would you go for guidance? And I've put Saga as a uh, shortening for sex and gender analysis. So thinking about when you're doing your research. Now, Amrita, I know you mentioned that you had uh, your policies uh, available online. Do you know how many people, researchers, are using that as their main point of contact for how to include this in their research? Or do you have any sort of interaction with researchers on their usefulness, I guess? Uh, well, we, we have a really high alt metric on our article and um, actually it's really interesting. There's a, a lot of general public interest, but then of course a lot of researchers. So it's quite clear to us that researchers are accessing our editorial and, and obviously and reading it. And we have had massive downloads of the article. So in terms of looking at the numbers of people actually accessing our editorial, we, we have a good idea of that. And you can actually see that anyone can go and have a look at that. They can go to the page and, and take a look. Um, so, but I do think, I, I, I think the NIH were big drivers of, of change in policy. And as a funder, they've made a big difference, I think. They've mm -hmm. raised the profile of the issue. Yeah, and uh, there's a Q&A the point that came up, which was other papers from the literature as well. Is there, um, I know you published a collection of articles around sex and gender analysis when you published your policy. Do you continue to highlight these at all or is there a sort of collection or a way that they're maybe tagged uh, as sort of case studies as we go through? Well, actually, the, so the, the journal, BJP, actually, we have two sister journals. We have uh, British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology and Pharmacology Research Perspectives. And what we're constantly doing is looking at material that's uh, in areas that are common across all of our journals. And we've just got a virtual issue together where the articles that were in our themed issue are going to be put together with articles that come from the clinical and, and from our open access journal. And so then the whole issues about sex research become highlighted again. It's a, a major area of concern for us and, and the editorial and the guidelines is just a first step, but we review our guidelines because as I said, we take a pragmatic approach. Things change, best practice change, uh, 
changes. The um, ARRIVE guidelines are being updated. They're going to be published on the, I think, Natasha, it's the 7th of July or 9th of July. The new guidelines, it's imminent. And, um, and so that changes the way that uh, one approaches mm -hmm. reporting of animal experimental work. Uh, admittedly, sex is not a major factor in, in the guidelines, but that is design and uh, analysis. And what happens with change, we're constantly reviewing anything that we do in terms of guidance and checklists, so they do get updated. Um, and Natasha, I just wanted to have a thought from you here. So you've seen the polling come through. A lot of people are saying their research institutes or their universities could be a primary place for guidance on this. How do you see in the change management program you put across um, some of the elements of that leading to these guidelines being published? Because I know that quite a lot of institutes don't have these sort of guidelines internally anyway. Where do you think they need to come from within these institutes? So when I sat within the Sanger Institute, um, and was part of the Wellcome Trust. One of the issues that I identified there was I conducted a survey to ask the staff, where did they look for advice and information? And there they said they looked at the management tree. They looked to their senior managers. But the problem was is that none of them had confidence and ability. So professional bodies have the real advantage because they can be very targeted to a community and to have, um, in a way, they can inspire people because they can provide that leadership that something is important. And similarly, a journal can act as that sort of professional field group to reach these targeted communities. And that is the same for the Research Institute. If, and that is part of forming that leadership, and that was John Cotter's, when you form that coalition across the organization, it can't be entirely from the bottom up. If you don't have the voice at the top of your institute saying that this is important, we believe in it then to be honest, it just sounds like it's another initiative that's not really going anywhere and isn't really valued. Mm -hmm. So um, I do, I think that they can deliver impact, but if only if that they've got buy-in from a senior person that is influential in those organizations to be the inspirational leaders. So it's back to being leadership that can yeah. drive it forward. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And we talk about, you know, top down and bottom up approaches for a lot of this work. And hopefully by engaging the number of researchers we've got here in the workshop, that's one element of that. But yeah, it's then take, making that sort of that leadership group take responsibility for this as well. Um, Inez, as a researcher yourself, um, how do you how do you see these yourself in the in the order that they're there? Um, so I think it depends. And I think that there are some communities that are much more receptive as, you know, when you introduce sex as a variable and it's uh, perhaps maybe because there's, uh, there's more awareness of differences already reported in the literature or female prevalence, for example, in immune diseases. Uh, but there are other communities that are uh, still quite reluctant and they will ask you up front, why are you using male, uh, female mice, for example? Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, uh, but I guess it's, it's okay to have to constant, we have to constantly justify ourselves with other things. So why not <laughs> for that? So I, I, yeah, so it, 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 I've, what I've seen is that it varies a lot. Yeah. Depending on the community that yeah. um, you work with. Yeah, definitely seeing it within a research community or a system type approach is really important. There was a Q&A that came through as well, just saying st from a statistician as well. So I think that sort of that trust in someone who knows how to do this, I think, is a really important feature of this and something we must remember as we go through. Um, so just want to move on to the next set of questions. So one of the main enablers that came up last week was around money funding um, and having additional funds of some way, shape or form to enable this. However, there are lots of different ways that we could get funders to uh, improve or implement sex and gender analysis. So I've got a couple of these broken down here. So one would be just generally more money available per sort of regular grant. Another would be thinking about marked funding within regular grants that was ring fenced exclusively for sex and gender analysis. So that could be thinking about, for example, we talk about the preclinical side of things additional caging or housing facilities for animals knowing that this was going to have to come through. Another one would be thinking about top-up funding to grants to support this that can be applied for. So that could also improve, for example, if a grant is already in progress. Um, thinking around mandating sex and gender analysis 
in grant applications or encouraging sex and gender analysis in grant applications. We've heard sort of both sides of that as well today. Um, and then thinking around time extensions as well. So time got brought up as another thing. Do people want additional time to improve sex and gender balance? And I've brought this one through because I know that previously uh, for this field, for sleeping um, fields where you're doing field studies or clinical studies with uh, participants, people were saying they were struggling to get numbers of people through the door to use within their research and actually they can try things at first but then it would you know it would be difficult to get the balance that they're looking for um, within this so feel free to rank these as we go through um, and uh, and Rita do you want to pop in any thoughts on some of this stuff from funders while I look well uh, actually the 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 policy uh, and I'm going to go back to the NIH again because they're the ones that have made so that it seems to me that the, the greatest strides in terms of raising the profile of sexism experiment available. In, in addition to mandating that it's considered in grant applications, what they've done is they've actually um, assigned funding specifically for exploring the influence of sex on biology. And they have centers of excellence. Um, they also have um, a, a, uh, additional funds that are made available to individuals for each individual research grant application if sex is going to be a component of, of their research. And these approaches have worked very, very well, it seems, in the US. Um, so there has to be investment, I think, in, in convincing researchers that the funding is going to be there for them to to add this element of this additional variable that they previously haven't considered and, and and with the funding then over time it will start to become an expected approach to experimental design the ultimate aim of course is to make research more translatable uh, some of the lack of translation relates entirely to the fact that um, uh, biomedical research is very much biased towards the male sex. Yeah, and I, th I think that comes through as well when we think about re reproducibility, which I know you touched on as well, Natasha. Um, we've had a question come through, and I don't know whether uh, Natasha or Inez, maybe you wanted to step in and answer this. Do you expect that the resistance to include sex as a variable will start to disappear or reduce as we get more women in STEM in, in general as researchers? So there is actually some research showing, and I can't remember the article, but it actually says that when it's a woman author, it is more likely to be studying both sexes. Mm -hmm. So inherently, and when you, you know, when you're as a person who's actively working on this topic, when I raise the issue, the general reaction from females was, of course, I want to be represented. Why aren't we doing this? The typical reaction I receive from senior males is more, where is the evidence that this is going to improve my research? Mm -hmm. So it's, there, is more greater resist, there is greater resistance in my experience base and what's being shown in the published literature. Yeah. So I do think um, as more women are more senior and more represented in research, then it would be naturally be a variable that would be encompass but well, of course we do operate within a network you know more so in a commercial setting than academic and therefore you know in some places it's easier to change than others yeah um i am conscious of time so i really appreciate everyone who's ranking these nice and quickly and um, there was just a, a quick comment that came through as well which was um someone would like to see recognition from funders and review panels when sex has been properly addressed in previous work when competing for new funding so yeah that that idea of creating the expectation that this is what you should do but also rewarding as well and i think that's really quite an important thing um, and i know we talk you know we talk a lot about carrot and stick versions of uh, approaching change and you know what's going to draw someone along as a benefit but also when do we penalize that i think drawing along as a benefit for competing for new funding looking at previous research i think is a really interesting approach and something that funded funders could consider um so i'll just leave this up for a couple more seconds if anyone's got any last minute changes or add additions to their ranking um i'll try and try and squeeze this last sort of couple of people to bring these through i've got um two more questions uh, and just the feedback at the end which takes five seconds so I want to try and get as much information from this as possible um, so I think if we go to the next one um, 
So what support changes are needed across the research system to enable sex and gender analysis? So this is looking around. So we've done funders because that was quite a specific one, but this is more generally across our entire sort of culture and system. And I can imagine you might have more thoughts as to what could be put on this, but I didn't want to go more than seven at this. So thinking about publishers asking for sex and gender analysis as standard, so a policy change there. Training programs from your employer, whether that's a research institute, a university or a um, commercial in, uh, or industry partner. Um, training programs from societies or professional bodies so thinking sort of that broader sort of idea of things um, uh, I've lost where I am conferences and events specifically covering sex and gender analysis so thinking about getting the information out there as well um, so awareness campaigns sharing of examples and case studies I know Natasha you mentioned that earlier as something that was quite important for showing how to actually do this in reality and where it's worked um, and at the top at the moment it's collaboratively developed guides or toolkits for researchers so not just a guide or a toolkit that comes out but that collaborative approach to developing it and I know Marita you mentioned as well how you brought in lots of people to develop those guidance and I think that's really important when we're doing something like this and speaks to some of what Natasha said around if you mandate things how much resistance you might get in that first initial pushback especially when people haven't been involved in that whole process um so uh natasha did you want to add any comments into this sort of around the general changes i know you had some thoughts around what needed to change with uh, within your presentation um yeah so i really you know i really do think it's awareness campaigns is needed you know you would look at in vitro people are just apps it's like a light bulb moment with them when you say a cell has a sex and they go like well of course oh, oh yes so it does you know and they, it, it's also part of the journey that we're having in that you know with p-values you think of them as yes no black or white and research questions we narrow a testing space and we go yes no and actually realizing that's not what we're delivering we're giving some evidence towards a conclusion and we're trying to slightly over egg that to get that paper published and actually we need to scale back that strategy of how we think about science and instead we're collecting evidence towards and we need to be more balanced in how we present things and it's all part of that journey you know some of the issues i have is when you do a conference or an event covering saga specifically you'll just get women coming okay mm -hmm. if you put a poster up on this topic you will engage just women and actually we need to reach the male leaders because they are predominantly our male leaders and you know that's the reality of the situation and so again it's this top up versus bottom you know bottom top down strategy is playing out but i think we cannot underestimate the challenges of that people face of making change so it is these toolkits it is this training and instead of thinking we need to learn about machine learning and everything else it can be really focused how do you graph the data when there are two sexes what would that look like how do you report it when you've got an interaction and a treatment effect what do you do it's really you know let's be honest about because we're expecting our scientists to be professionals at so much that's a little bit of an overstretch and so they need to be supported mm. hopefully did um, that answer the question yeah, i think that did thank you so much Natasha. i just want to say there's another one that came through in the q a which is zero tolerance for poor study design and actually that could be applied through multiple ways funders or publishers or anything like that and that's where we we move towards that mandating territory which you know it could be a quite a big driver for us. Um, and Rita, I see that uh, the publishers asking for sex and gender analysis is there in fifth at the moment, but oh. I think we spoke, we spoke briefly about this being a system. Um, Inez, did you want to have a quick comment about managing expectations before we move on to the last slide on this? Yeah, I, I, it's just from, from personal experience also. I think that sometimes uh, exploring sex differences is really put aside when you don't show striking uh, differences and just and, and so it's balancing the expectations that not absolutely everything is going to have a major impact but just showing that you have explored whether it could have an impact or not in itself it's important so it's also this lack of evidence but unless you look at it you're not going to to know and sometimes not everything has to be massive effect versus no effect but there's some nuances as well and and um, despite all that, that's the fact that they're not amazing differences. It's not an excuse for not exploring them, I think. 
Yeah. But that's actually really good news. If you do an experiment and don't see an effect that depends on success on the sex, that's a success because you can say my treatment effect does not depend on success on the sex. And here's the success. But it doesn't mean you stop and continue just studying one sex. You just continue that journey because you don't know when. Yeah. But actually, that's great news because we have but much have more to confidence. The standards that it's an important question to. Me. <laughs> but no, I think I, it, it isn't going to cost that much more money because you're not doubling your sample size. You are not. Um, you're not doubling your sample size. You're just splitting half the animals to males and females. The bit that the complexity is in the analysis and the practical issues. It isn't a twice a bigger experiment and therefore twice as expensive. Yeah, that's yeah. the misconception. That's, that's, but the next step would be if you find that there mm, is a big sex exactly. difference, then what you have to do is prospectively design a study that allows you to test that yeah. so that you are powered to do it. So, I mean, that, those are the issues in this. Is it in the first place when you're breeding your new transgenic, you should be looking at all of the animals. You shouldn't, you know, it, it should just be part of the normal route to assessing phenotype in, in any experimental, in vivo experimental yeah. system. But um, it's, it's once you've identified that there might be something that you then go and prospectively design the right experiment to test um the uh how how big that difference between the sexes actually is um now we're on to the last slide which people have started popping their ideas into already around what can you personally do as a researcher um and uh, rita you mentioned that you uh, had looked at this in your research as well and just wanted to have some sort of thoughts around sort of what actions you take in order to account for this sort of in the way that you do your research well, I think actually in almost all of my research now, um, sex is, is part of the thought process. Um, it was some time ago that I discovered, uh, just because I was short of animals actually, that we had a major difference in what was described then as EDHF between males and females. So in male resistance arteries, um, the EDHF, endothelial-derived hyperpolarizing factor, plays a, a, a minimal role in determining vascular tone. In females, it is the predominant vasodilator influence. Completely different. That was a bit of a shock and a bit of a wake-up call for me personally and got me studying sex, actually, um, uh, in terms of identifying the differences between males and females. And what we recently did and translated into the clinical setting is that we had evidence that inflammatory immune responses were different between, different between the sexes. We were particularly interested in a certain aspect and we went into uh, experimental medicine um, clinical studies where we looked at an acute inflammatory response and found massive differences between males and females. But we did a sample size estimation um, to try and work out the numbers that, that we would need. Um, but I just want to say, I think that um, uh, identifying the best kind of design and incorporating that into... Uh, the very beginning of the thought process for the, the the research question that you have, that if sex is right there at the start, then you're in a strong position to make a clear statement on whether there is a difference um, with sex. I think it's really tricky in terms of upskilling and statistics. I think we do need people to advise us. It, we do need hands-on experience. There are different types of advisors. And for instance, at the journal, we have uh, a number of different um, stat statisticians uh, advise us on the publications, uh, the manuscripts that come into the journal. Um, we never have just a single view because no two statisticians agree on anything. <laughs> Um, just, I know that we're running slightly over now, so I'd love to close off. I just want to say a couple of comments that have come through. So thank you, Diane, saying it's a great workshop. I agree it's important to run sex differences study, but what's more, what's more important is to collect data in women participants to fill the gap of scientific evidence compared to male data. In other words, if we want to enroll more female participants, why should we have to justify ourselves by simultaneously running sex different analysis? There is some danger to focus the discussion too closely on sex difference rather than on collecting data in female the bottom line we need more data on women whether or not we run sex differences i just wanted to reply to that a little bit actually and just say that 
Um, one of the things I find quite interesting is the fact that if you look at previous published studies where they haven't either said what sex they're looking at or they have categorically only used males, I feel like that is a justification and quite low hanging fruit really to run a similar study, but just in females and to see whether or not you get the same result using similar methods or even um, just up, up include improving the data behind a certain hypothesis if it's the same result or whether it's different. So I think that's really important to acknowledge is that when we're talking about sex differences, sometimes that might not even be in within your own piece of research, but within a piece of research that's already been published by someone else. So you could do that additional end part of the experiment and quite quickly sort of move on, move on our understanding. And there was also another comment that came through in the poll around highlighting the lack of sex and gender analysis in studies when reviewing manuscripts so again thinking about as a reviewer what you can do what you can do when you're on a reviewing panel um but i would like more focus on clinical research sex differences yeah i think so some of the uh, previous talks talks a little bit more around the clinical aspects of this as well and thank you nina about the workshop um and then we've got another comment through around full transparency in reporting sex for in vivo and in vitro studies. Yeah, I think that's something that we can take on ourselves as well. So I just want to say thank you so much, everyone who's participated. As always, we have a final sort of four question feedback. Just put on the slider how you feel about this session as a whole, the speakers as well as the workshop section at the end. I hope this has been really useful for everyone. I found it fascinating myself. Um, and I think there's a lot of really important um, really important information that we came couldn't think about around how to make this make what we've learned over the past through three weeks into an actual active change as well um natasha thanks for the important note on experiments need to run a study on two sexes at the same time can't retrospectively bring in and know whether it's sampling differences on real difference depends on sex completely agree with you i kind of see it said see it more as a this hasn't been done so let's have a quick look and then once we uh once we have an idea we can go through from that so completely agree with you from a stats perspective you've got to do it at the same time but if we're filling in some additional information i think it's okay <laughs> um thank you everyone who's participated speakers uh the organizers and all of you participants in within this workshop as well um the three sessions are like i said they're all on um I'm going to be on YouTube. We're going to compile all of these slides as well from all the feedback and the polling and make sure that that's available for everyone too. Um, and I think we'll be hopefully writing this all up as well as a sort of series as a whole across the three. So if you haven't been able to see all three, they should be available for everyone. Other than that, please fill in the feedback on your way out. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure over the past three weeks. Um, and hopefully I'm sure we'll be sharing this and being I guess virtually in touch again so thank you everyone um, and I'll just leave this up here yeah thank you